Hi, my name is Doug from Hanna Instruments. Today we're going to be talking about EC, why and how to test it, your probe options, and some best practices. It goes by many names, conductivity, electrical conductivity, electrolytic conductivity, EC, but they all mean the same thing. Before going into the EC definition, there are a few other terms to know first. Conductance is the ability for a substance to conduct an electrical current and is measured in Siemens. Resistivity is the inverse of conductance, the ability of a substance to resist transmitting an electrical current. Keeping those new terms in mind, EC is the measurement of the ability of a substance to conduct an electrical current over a defined area. The key part here for the measurement to have meaning is the defined area. This defined area is also known as the cell constant because that area is preset in the probe via probe type at the factory. That's why conductivity is measured as the ability of the substance to conduct an electrical current per area. Some examples of measurement units include Siemens per centimeter, micro Siemens per centimeter, and millisiemens per centimeter. So you have an EC measurement, but what does it mean? Why test for conductivity? EC is a concentration measurement. It's important to know that it is not a specific concentration measurement, meaning not all substances carry a charge to be measured by EC. A substance is only able to transmit electricity if there are ions present. Ions are particles that carry a charge, either positive or negative, in the solution. So, for example, if you had a water sample and dissolved a bunch of sugar in it, the EC measurement would not change much. This is because sugar does not break apart into charged ions. You may also have more than one ion in a solution, and the EC measurement will not differentiate. One EC measurement is called TDS, total dissolved solids. This measures the amount of dissolved matter, both organic and inorganic, in a solution. TDS results are in milligrams per liter or grams per liter. Just remember, electrical conductivity is directly related to the concentration of the ionic dissolved solids. This measurement is considered an indirect measurement as there is a conversion that must be done from EC to TDS. A true TDS measurement is a gravimetric measurement. Every solution has a unique conversion ratio. The conversion ratio is calculated using a known TDS value for the substance, then divided by the measured conductivity value of that same substance. For example, if your solution has a known TDS of 56 grams per liter, and your measured EC was 800 millisiemens per centimeter, then your conversion ratio, or factor, would be 0.07. It's important to know the conversion factor, especially if you're comparing your results to another lab's results, test site, published data, or reference data. Conductivity can be used to determine salinity, primarily in different waters. This is important to note, as EC can only be used to calculate the salinity of sample matrices such as seawater. This is because all of the measurement scales are in reference to seawater. The three scales for measuring salinity are practical salinity unit, percent scale, and natural seawater scale. The PSU was defined by UNESCO in 1978 and is able to measure salinity from 0 to 42. This scale is a conductivity ratio and does not have any units. The percent scale can measure salinity on a scale of 0 to 400%. The natural seawater scale was defined by UNESCO in 1966 and can measure salinity on a scale of 0 to 80 parts per thousand. These measurements, when using an EC meter, are considered indirect because the final number displayed is calculated via an algorithm within the meter. The algorithm converts the EC measurement to salinity according to the selected scale. So why test conductivity? EC is important in a variety of industries. Let's go over a few examples. Monitoring conductivity is a good way to check the salinity of an aquaculture operation. For example, appropriate salinity is key to healthy clam aquaculture. Clams are interesting creatures as the salinity of their blood is directly dependent on the salinity of their environment. For them, blood salinity affects their enzyme activity. This enzyme activity directly influences their growth rate and health. For a quick fix, clams open and close their shells to try and control the amount of salinity inside of them. However, if the proper salinity isn't maintained, you can end up with stunted clam growth or death. 20 to 30 parts per thousand of salinity is considered healthy for clams. Boilers help heat our homes, businesses, public buildings, and production processes. For large-scale boilers, especially those in boiling towers, a lot of feed water moves through the system. 
Feed water has impurities in it, and these impurities can cause issues. As the water is heated, it evaporates, becomes steam, and the impurities are left behind. Over time, you'll experience a buildup of these impurities, and they can influence the efficiency of the boiler system. Two ways of getting rid of the buildup are to test surface water for dissolved solids or treat it, and bottom blowdown where the system is reversed and buildup gets flushed out. Monitoring EC can be used to monitor the TDS and automatically initiate blowdown. This would increase efficiency to the boiler system. While there are many types of plating processes out there, they all have one thing in common. They always will need a rinse bath. Rinse baths help to clean contaminants and residues from the metal pieces in between different points of the plating process. All of the residues introduce contamination to the rinse baths, and eventually, they're too contaminated to use. However, to waste an entire rinse bath takes a lot of time and produces a lot of waste. To minimize this, EC is monitored to determine when some additional water needs to be flushed through to keep the baths usable. If you have healthy soil, you have happy plants. Conductivity is measured to infer the amount of dissolved solids, nutrients, and salinity of soil. Each type of soil has unique EC properties, but it's a good way to tell if you need to fertilize or water your plants more. When growers are looking to fertilize their crops or to maintain a growth media, it's a fine balance between the nutrients. A great way to monitor these nutrients is to measure EC and TDS regularly. Higher EC and TDS indicates there are more nutrients available, while lower numbers indicate that nutrient addition should be made. Remember, this number is non-specific, so it won't tell you which nutrient may be deficient. Fertigators help to have a precise and efficient way to monitor EC and adjust the nutrients with measured automatic dosing. Besides normal water purity, conductivity is used to determine water purity for ultra-pure water, water for injection, and water for drug preparations. There are three stages of testing to determine if the water is suitable. The stages have very strict parameters, including the cell constant must be known within 2%, a minimum of resolution of 0.1 microsiemens per centimeter at the lowest range, have an accuracy of within 0.1 microsiemens per centimeter, and at least have the ability to shut off temperature compensation. Now that we've gone through some examples of why you would test conductivity, let's go over the types of probes. It's important to find a probe that fits your testing needs. There are three types of probes that we'll cover. These are two electrode probes, also called amperometric probes, four ring probes, also known as potentiometric probes, and toroidal or inductive probes. Two electrode probes work through two electrodes that are isolated from each other, but in such a way that they can maintain contact with the sample at the same time. And they're made from non-reactive materials, such as stainless steel or graphite. The materials need to be non-reactive, so the probes do not have side reactions with the sample, but also so that they do not degrade when in contact with the sample. The two electrodes pass a current at a specific frequency through the sample. Remember what we talked about earlier with ions? That comes into play here. The more ions you have in your sample, the lower the resistance you will have for the current to reach the other electrode. This will result in a higher conductivity reading. A four ring probe works a bit differently than the two electrode probe. Instead of having two electrodes that pass an alternating current back and forth, this probe has four platinum rings on the body of the electrode, as well as a vent hole. The top and bottom rings act as drive electrodes for the probe. These two rings apply an alternating voltage to the sample, and this induces a current. The two center rings are your sensor rings, or electrodes. They measure the potential drop in the current generated by the drive electrodes. Toroidal probes are sometimes called non-contact probes, or electrodeless probes. They require a control processor. Therefore, they are used in process equipment. The probe looks a bit like a donut, as it is constructed of two inductively coupled coils stacked on top of each other. The two coils are encased in a chemically resistant plastic sheath. One coil acts as the driver electrode that applies a current, a magnetic field, while the second is the receiver or sensor electrode. Then, changes in the field are monitored. So why would you choose one probe over another? What are the upsides or downsides to the technology? Let's go through that now. Two electrode probes are easy to use, relatively inexpensive, require very little sample to get an accurate reading, and you don't have to worry about the fringe field effect. Don't worry, we'll go over what that is in a bit. 
Something to be aware of with two electrode probes are that the space between the two electrodes has to be stable. If the electrodes get bent or if a residue builds up, you will get inaccurate readings. Each probe only covers a limited EC range. So if you're testing low range and high range samples, you will need to buy multiple probes and or meters. The last thing to note on two electrode probes is something called polarization effect. The polarization effect happens when the charge builds up between the two electrodes. This extra charge can cause your EC readings to be lower than they are expected to be. This can be minimized by two electrode probes that have their electrodes made out of graphite instead of stainless steel. When using a four ring probe, you only need one probe to cover your entire testing range, up to one semen per centimeter. You also do not have to worry about the polarization effect. The construction of this probe with how the rings are situated causes a constant field of current to be maintained around the rings. It acts as a shield. For the four ring probe, you will have to use a larger sample volume to adequately submerge the probe, and it is more of a financial investment. While you don't have to worry about the polarization effect, you do need to be wary of the fringe field effect. This happens when the measurement field, that constant current, extends outside the probe. You only need to worry about the fringe field effect if your probe is too close to the sides of the container or pipe where you are taking an EC measurement. A good rule of thumb is to keep the probe at least an inch away from all surfaces. The distance you need to keep the probe varies, so just check your manual. Toroidal probes are great because the probe never actually touches the sample, since they're encased in plastic. You don't have to worry about the polarization effect or the fringe field effect. The probe has a very low chance of fouling or getting clogged, and you do not need calibration solutions. They are very accurate in high range samples, up to two siemens per centimeter. The plastic body is chemically resistant. However, toroidal probes are expensive and not suitable for low range EC samples. Even though the plastic sheath is chemically resistant, it's not impervious. Be careful not to have organic solvents in your sample or concentrated chlorine. Select plating baths can also cause issues with incompatibility with the plastic. One parameter that can influence your conductivity readings is temperature. This is due to how temperature affects ions in solution. When a solution is at a higher temperature, the ions become excited and the resistance drops and conductance increases. When a solution is cooled, the ions do not have as much energy, so the conductance drops and the resistivity increases. You can introduce a margin of error if your calibration solutions are not the same temperature as your sample. To compensate for this, probes and or meters can have a temperature sensor. EC meters can then adjust the readings using an internal calculation to a reference temperature, or beta. Here are a few best practices when using your EC probes. Probe immersion is important. With a two electrode probe, you only need the probe to be touching the solution. Four ring probes need the vent holes on the side of the probe to be submerged for accurate measurements. Calibrate daily if you're using the probes daily, otherwise calibrate the probe prior to use. Regardless of the probe being used, keep the position of the probe in mind when taking a measurement. A one point calibration where the standard is close to the expected value is common when calibrating your probe. One thing to know is that the calibration standards have no buffering capacity and are very easily contaminated. When calibrating, we recommend following the subsequent steps. You will need beakers, a calibration standard, a meter, EC probe, and deionized water. Before even placing a probe into the standard, rinse the probe in deionized water. Gently shake off the excess water from the probe, immerse the probe in a beaker or cup with some standards, and swirl the probe. Next, you can calibrate the probe in your standard. Immerse the probe in your standard and gently tap the probe on the bottom of the beaker. This removes any trapped air bubbles. Gently stir the solution. You don't want to introduce extra air bubbles into the standard. Wait for the probe to stabilize and continue on to measurement. Measuring a sample follows the same steps for two electrode probes and four ring probes. Just substitute your sample for the calibration standard and you're good to go. Thank you for watching this video and we hope you found it helpful. Don't forget to subscribe and follow us on social media. There are links to follow in the description of this video. If you have any questions, type in a comment below or email us at sales at See you soon.